So up until now, we've been talking about the social construction of gender and the social construction of sexuality. So in the United States, as we, I think, know, we have in general constructed this binary around gender. People come in two categories. As a result of that, then sexuality also becomes a binary, right? So you have male and female, and you're either heterosexual or homosexual. It's like there's four different kinds of people in the world, right? And both of these, maybe all four, are linked to some sort of identity and identification. And again, we've talked about that. This is not necessarily the case in many societies, and we also don't always agree in, when we look cross-culturally and historically at what these would be. But that, I think, sums up in some ways what our social ideas have been. Maybe they're changing, but that's been the traditional, I think, point of view, is that you have a binary in gender and a binary in sexuality. Now, I don't, I don't want you to think about this very much, but just a little tiny bit. We talked about third or fourth genders, right? Now in our society, you can have this binary, right? But what if you lived in a society where there was a third gender, maybe a biological male had taken on the female role, and then you have sex with a third gender person? What kind of identity might that confer? Or you know what I mean? It's kind of kind of outside of our our realm. Anyway, it's just a little puzzling there. All right, but I want to talk about this because. In the 1980s and 1990s, people started to ask, is it the fact that we have such a strict gender binary, that we see the world socially as male and female, which makes us believe that there's a biological sex binary? You see what I'm saying? So because we are so hung up on sorting people into two groups, gender-wise, putting on blue, pink clothes and making sure you're playing with the right toys, is that also what is in some ways making us insist that biologically people only come in two sexes? Now, there were a few things going on at the time that people started to ask this question. For one thing was the discovery that biology was a little bit messier than we thought that some people might be chromosomally XXY. Some people might be chromosomally X0. That hormones didn't always work the way we thought they would. That some people who identified as female might be producing quite high amounts of testosterone. And that that also varied. And so the, chromos the chromosomes were more variable than we once imagined. The Hormonal levels were more variable, that certain things might change based on your maternal environment. And so people started to think about this. It also, as Gus talks about, in some cases, it was probably the case that in the, say, 1940s and 50s, if someone was born with ambiguous genitalia, the doctors would kind of huddle and then they try to decide which sex they were going to make the baby, the newborn. And so there were people that over time said, hey, wait a second, let's not do a surgery immediately as soon as this person comes out, let's let it go for a little bit. So, you know, I mean, this is probably also something that people started talking about. The other thing that started happening during this time, we talked about the gender reveal party which really only became possible because people are using ultrasounds. And so people would use these ultrasounds and they discover what they believe was the sex of the infant. And then all of a sudden you'd be building a nursery and painting it a certain color, or you'd buy only one color of stuff. 
the kid hasn't even been born yet and they've already got a gender appropriate nursery. Now this is very different than how it was even back in the 1950s and 60s. Before ultrasounds, people used to buy what they called twin insurance, which meant that if you had twins, they'd give you double of everything, which meant that some women were pregnant with twins and didn't know it until two babies came out, which is mind boggling, right? I mean, it's like, wait a second, you know, actually one of our uh, a long time history professor, this happened to her. She didn't know that she had twins until there were two, but luckily she had the twin insurance. And so, you know, they gave her two bassinets for these two kids. So it's crazy. I mean, so in that situation, you certainly weren't going to paint a nursery or have all your clothes color coordinated for the newborn. I do sometimes wonder if we've gotten in some ways a little bit, how to say, because we introduced gendered ideas so early to these poor little babies, if this is you know, making us get all excited about this in ways that I'm not sure people used to be. I'm not saying the 1950s were better. I'm just saying, you know, you didn't you didn't have all these things built in from like pre-birth anyway. So some scholars began to think differently about biological sex. Now this was not gender. This was an article by Anne Fausto Sterling published in 1993 called The Five Sexes, Why Male and Female Are Not Enough. Oh, Amy, are you ready to talk about this? No. No, okay. Yeah, this is a long time ago that you did reference this and Guest calls it the theory of five sexes, which is pretty intense, right? I mean, so the idea is that biologically we might be able to sort people not just into two, but into five. Now, it wasn't, I don't know what figure Fausto Sterling came up with, but there was another figure that was thrown around. Guest also cites this figure that is high of 1.7% of, and it's hard, I'll, for reasons I'll discuss, it's hard to say who exactly they were including, were people who had intersex conditions, who were in some ways ambiguous, chromosomally genitalia, something, some sort of intersex condition. It was as high as 1.7%. Now, not too long ago, the biological anthropologist wrote, Augustine Fuentes wrote an article called Biological Science Rejects the Sex Binary and That's Good for Humanity. And at the time, this was written about a year ago, and at the time that Fuentes wrote this article, I think most anthropologists I don't think this was very controversial in the sense that we had all agreed that, yeah, this division of sex into only two, a biological binary, didn't really capture all the ways of being male, female, or both. There you go. Now, so this, I guess I would say to most anthropologists would be kind of non-controversial. We're just like, yeah, that's probably true. However, boy, oh boy, when he puts out that article or says anything like that, there have now descended upon poor Augustine Fuentes hundreds and hundreds of people armed with a keyboard just taking him to task. So basically, they just, he got ratioed hard on this one. And, uh, you know, people are very mad about these things. My favorite response was this one. He drank a Kool-Aid loaded with political leftist laxatives. A travesty that higher education is brainwashing our youth and future leaders to believe an idea. You and your cronies are contributing to the demise of our country. Don't ask for a Kleenex after the fallout, Augustine. I'm like, oh, I wish I could brainwash people. I wish I had that ability. 
I can barely get people to pay attention, let alone brainwash you. I would love to be able to do that, but I, that's, you know, it's kind of based on a weird assumption about my power in this situation. <laughs> anyway. If it makes you feel any better, there's probably a 99% chance that person didn't actually read it. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, who reads anything? You just respond to a headline. That's what I do. No, I don't. I just... Cronies, like, this is... Cronies? Yeah, that's me. I guess I'm a crony. I follow Augustine, and he follows me. He just liked one of my tweets. I'm happy. I'm one of these bad people. So, actually, what follows is going to be my take. I'm just going to say that I'm not trying to brainwash you. I'm telling you, this is my take. I think it's based on my thinking. I, I mean, I think it's based on thinking that I've done. But, you know, you might be able to find somebody who's better at this, but I'll just say it. All right. So I want to start back with this Five Sexes article in uh, the Anne Fausto Sterling piece. Now, in the year 2000, Anne Fausto Sterling published another article, which was called The Five Sexes Revisited. So about seven years later, because it had been pretty huge, a pretty provocative and huge article. And so she went back and looked at it again. And Guest also cites this article. But there's a quote in this article, which is really weird. This is Anne Fausto Sterling saying, I had intended to be provocative, but I had also written with tongue firmly in cheek. First, we have to figure out what does it mean to have your tongue in cheek? You're holding back. <laughs> it's a little more extreme than that, actually. I guess this is this is not an expression that I use a lot. I don't know. Does anybody use this expression or heard it? No. You have to, if you look it up, it's tongue in cheek means that you are somewhat joking, but appearing to be serious. And so if you say that your tongue is firmly in cheek, you're saying, oh, I was just, I was just being provocative. I wasn't really proposing that there were five sexes. I was just having fun. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, lightly satiric or something. It's like, a, it's a strange expression. Like I said, we don't use it that much, but if someone were to come in up and say, oh no, I didn't mean that I had my, that was me with my tongue firmly in cheek, I'd be like, oh, okay, you, then it's not serious. So that's a weird way to describe it, right? Because Guest describes it as the theory of five sexes. He doesn't tell you that she had her tongue in her cheek when she's saying that. There's also the debate about this 1.7% intersex figure. So if you look on Wikipedia, which is a good source, there's another person named Leonard Sachs says, if this term is to retain any meaning, we should restrict it to conditions in which chromosomal sex is inconsistent with phenotypic sex, in which the phenotype is not classifiable as either male or female. So it's more like 0.018%. Now that is a huge difference. So basically what Sachs is saying is that people who classified, were classifying things that didn't, shouldn't really count as intersex into this 1.7% number. And to just illustrate how much of a difference that is, it's either 1.7% is, you know, almost two people out of every hundred. Whereas what Sachs is saying is it's, two people out of every 10,000, which is a different way to wrap your minds about around this is, I was trying to think about ways to make the statistics work. Is it that there are 20 people at Hartwick College which might be classified as intersex? I mean, maybe these conditions come on later in life, or is it limited to two people in all of Oneonta counting Hartwick SUNY and the whole town? I mean, that's a pretty big difference, right? I mean, is it is it two? Or is it 20 right here on campus? Now, my feeling is that my feeling is that it might be somewhere between that, that Sachs is low. And 
Fausta Sterling is high, but uh, you know, it's a pretty huge difference. All right, so my take again. We talked about skin color and the biological variation of skin color. Skin color is completely clinal. We can line up all the people in the world or we can line up people geographically and you can walk along and there's never a line. You can say on one side, this side. It's completely gradual all the way through. As far as sex variation goes, there is a lot of individual variation. So when we talk about the average height of guys, for example, versus the average height of girls, there's obviously individual variation, and there's also a lot of overlap in those categories. But well, this is where I get nervous. My take is, though, that basically it's not a it's not a continuum in the same sense that skin color is a continuum that it basically does clump into two categories. There might be some outliers, and there are outliers, and there's intermediate, but to say that there are five distinct biological categories, I don't know. Now, I don't like the term binary because it might be scientifically correct, but the way that we use binary implies that there are two groups that do not overlap, right? And so you would say that it is not just an average difference, but like that all in this group are different from all in this group. Again, that's maybe not the way it's used scientifically. I think when we use the word binary in popular life, we also consider it to be some sort of opposition or antagonism. And that's not the way if sex is a binary that it works. So what we actually see biologically is we do see sex, what the biologists call sexual dimorphism, some average differences between males and females as a category. But we also share a gene pool, which means that dimorphism is always going to be constrained by the fact that our genes are always being swapped around. Now, I borrowed this formulation from a evolutionary geneticist on Twitter, but it was so complicated that I couldn't really completely understand it. Basically, he was responding to Fuentes in this whole debate, and what he said is that genetically speaking, we, can, we see that males and females within species share a common gene pool, and recombination constrains the evolution of sexual dimorphism. That is to say, as when we recombine sexually and produce new offspring, we can't go that far apart with sexual dimorphism because we all share the same genes. Every allele spends exactly 50% of its evolutionary lifetime in the bodies of each sex. Whoa. Which sets the stage for sexual antagonism when sex-specific selection favors different phenotypic optima in males and females. Like I said, that was getting way too biological for me, so I tried to explain it in my own way. So he says that he believes that if biologists and non-biologists alike were aware of this solid theoretical framework in evolutionary genetics, many misunderstandings and not so fruitful discussions, discussions, I would say anthems like sex is binary or sex is a continuum would fade away and become meaningful. Now, again, I think that when he says biologists and non-biologists, I think he's talking to people who know something about alleles and, and, and biology. He may not be talking to just people like me who don't understand those things. But um, his point is that sloganeering within the sciences I, on either side is not, really a, it's not really a good way to represent what we see, which is uh, a lot of sharing, but also some sexual dimorphism. I would add to that, beyond the biology, that even what we consider to be sexual dimorphism, that is the differences in averages between the people we label men and the people we label women, is shaped by our sociocultural environment. 
we talked about in, I think, a class ago, the role of food and how if we're giving certain nutrients to boys and not girls or giving other, giving, you know, in the, like I said, in, in 100 years ago, you gave proteins to the boys and sweets to the girls, that's going to result in a different kind of body architecture. Or if you encourage certain people to engage in certain kinds of sports and athletic activity, weightlifting, muscle building, or the kinds of occupations that are we try to channel people into, that's going to have also a biological effect so that when we're measuring things like sexual dimorphism, it's going to be different than we might expect. And of course, it's shaped by our unequal access to resources. So if you were of a, if you, if you don't have enough money to have enough food, how is that going to be distributed in your own family? Is it going to be along these kinds of gendered lines? 